you've got to start from the beginning of the interaction because a lot of the influences uh, uh, from that beginning carried through. The influences of the volume of alcohol that was poured into this country, the volume of weapons that was poured into the country. This was the genesis of casual killings. This was the genesis of irresponsible governance because a lot of the coastal chiefs who, if they were sober, would not engage in the trade. They were plied with full strength alcohol. When I was in, uh, I beg you love, when I was in, uh, on a tour of the Caribbean, not a Caribbean cruise, we went to some of these rum factories and you were able to sample, because I had read that the, the strength of the rum that was being supplied to these uh, coastal peoples was 80% well, proof. 80%? 80%. So wow. while I was in the Caribbean, I, I had the opportunity to sample uh, a rum of 80%. My goodness. Just a little sip of the thing. Your ears immediately on fire. Your, uh, there was sensation in your ankles. Wow. So you can imagine that it was like opium as it damaged the people of Hong Kong and South China that was forced upon them. The alcohol absolutely debilitated our people such that the, uh, the society then becomes dysfunctional. Imagine the people who were fearful of their own gods, they lived in Maria, etc. And all of a sudden, this full strength, high strength poison is being poured in. Hello and welcome to Channel's Book Club. My name is Olakunle Kasumu and it's great to be on this show today. As always, a show where we discuss all things books. Well, I've got a book here with a fascinating title. Many years ago, a, a man called John Hawkins was a slave trader, an English slave trader. He came here, took people away, turned them into slaves in the Americas. Uh, remember, we had over 400 years of the transatlantic slave trade. A lot of people don't know that over 4 million people we're taking from this place that we now call Nigeria. That's apart from other places in Africa. I mean, this place that we now call Nigeria, over 400, 4 million of our people were taken away to become slaves in the Americas. Did, did you know that? That's, that's a bomb. That's, that's big news. That's something we should, we should study, we should research, find out what are the implications of that, and so on. Anyway, Hawkins went with slaves um, and the Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth I, was happy about that venture. And she saw that it held a lot of potential profits for her and for England. So she dived into the business of slave trade. She gave John Hawkins a ship. She leased a ship to him for a second expedition. Now, that second expedition was very successful and made Queen Elizabeth I a lot of money and effectively made slave trade official in England. And England became um, the greatest slave trader in the whole of Western Europe and the world. Uh, now, that ship she leased to John Hawkins was named, guess what? Jesus of Lübeck. And from there, Dele Ogun, our guest for today, came up with the title of his fascinating book titled A Slave Ship Called Jesus. Well, that's the story behind the title. I thought I should tell you that story before I shared the title with you in case you're wondering what kind of title is this. Well, that's a background. And this story, this book exposes the history of the transatlantic slave trade. Oh, it's mind-blowing. I just kept reading and reading. I've finished reading. I'm starting all over again. It's mind-blowing. Well, let's get to meet with Dele Ogu and then dive into this book of his, a slave ship called Jesus. Enjoy this. Dele Ogu is a historian, publisher, lawyer, speaker, and author. Ogun, who is the convener of the Fatherland Group, is an alumnus of London Metropolitan University, the Chartered Institute of Taxation of England and Wales, and the London School of Economics and Political Science. 
He is the author of several books, including A Fatherless People, Oibo Came to Africa, Ostrich Nation, and The Law, The Lawyers, and The Lawless, 50 Years of Britain, amongst others. Ogu joins Channel's book club to discuss his latest book, A Slave Ship Called Jesus. A slave ship called Jesus. Hmm. You know, when I first saw this book and um, I considered us featuring it, I said, I hope I don't get in, I'll get in trouble with viewers. <laughs> I've been considering, of course, for obvious reasons. It is hard hitting. Yeah, a, a slave ship called Jesus. Mm. Um, why this title and what motivated this book? I would like you to introduce it to viewers and then we dig in. Yeah, I mean, the, as far as the title is concerned, I was just minding my own business. I was just, as any um, educated African should, seeking to teach myself about what happened in that trade. What was it all about? How did it start? And by trade, you mean the slave trade, transatlantic slave, the transatlantic trade. slave trade. How did it start? Mm -hmm. What was going on? And it's in the course of research that you come across certain factual details, and finding that one of the ships was called Amazing Grace, another one was called the Jesus of Lubeck. Now that hit me hard. Given that I was raised in a Christian setting, I was struck by the fact that this evil trade, this where you ship people uh, out of their continent, you, 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 you wretch them out of their environment, you shove them into the boat, chain them down, you sail them across the oceans onto these plantations where they're often worked to death systematically. And these ships can be called the Jesus Even of Uber, religious names. Religious names. Mm -hmm. And what's especially when you consider that this was a time when Christianity was very strong in Europe, such that attendance in church was compulsory. It's not like now they don't go to church. It's our people who are all running to the church. They don't go. But then their approach to church was as our approach is now. And just imagine us in this era, assuming the trade never happened, and assuming we were the ones going to initiate the trade. And the ship, we say, is going to be called the Jesus of Lubeck, the grace of God. How does that happen? So ships used to take human cargoes mm. from here mm -hmm. to the Americas and so on, mm. were labeled grace of God. Grace of and God. then, of course, um, Jesus of Lubeck. Yeah. That's where your title That's where my they the gave They gave me the title. title. They gave me the title. Mm, interesting. Uh, let, let's let's we'll we'll, we'll dig in, in into this. I mean, we don't have so much time, but we'll try. Um, do you think that um, not enough is known about a slave trade history, uh, and what's the danger of this ignorance? Uh, we certainly do not know enough about this very vital period in our existence. This was three centuries. This was the 1600s to the late 1800s. About 400 years. About 400 years. That is a huge chunk of one's civilized existence not to know anything about. And uh, on, in, contrast, in contrast, China, who we try to say we, we want to aspire to be, they are so versed in their history. The every aspect the of Chinese. their history. Yes, the Chinese. Every aspect of their history. They have a concept called the 100 years of national humiliation. So they soak themselves in the understanding and knowledge of what happened. Because that's a key part to how you got to where you are. But if we say it all happened a long time ago, it means that the events that happened then, we're not able to recognize them in our present. So, for example, much of our setting now, the kind of governance that we have, is not wholly dissimilar to plantation life. 
where you had overseers over the enslaved unfortunates laboring in the fields in all sorts of inhumane conditions. And then the overseers sat above them, punishing them accordingly. And they were rewarded because the overseers were just like the managers on the ground. The owners will be back home in England, back home in America, back home in Europe. So you see that relationship, you could almost transpose it to what we have now in terms yeah. of what we call governance. And that's because we haven't studied the past. We can't recognize that in reality, what we call democracy today is it was almost like plantation. It's just slight redecoration, but substantively much the same. Mm. Interesting. A slave ship called Jesus is basically the story of the transatlantic slave trade yes. in, in, in many ways. Yes. I would like you to, uh, I mean, is, is that correct? Would you like to it's, elaborate a bit it, on, it, it on is, what this book is about? It is essentially a study of the trade, but with particular reference, with particular reference to faith, with particular reference to Christianity, uh, the church in relation to that trade, uh, especially when people understand that the trade was conducted under license from the head of the church, the Pope, as it then was, uh, until England now, initially, England was not party to that trade. They became the, the league champions. It was initially Spain. It was initially Spain and Portugal. And Portugal, Because yeah. Spain was the lead Catholic country. And yeah. you could only get into the trade under license from the Pope. So, the, so the, he gave licenses for people to come to this part of the world, take people, and then go and sell. Yes. So basically, the, it was a business it was a, it that, was, that needed licenses. It was a commercial enterprise. Mm -hmm. It was controlled. And uh, uh, the book explains how the British now got into the trade, which was the creation of the Church of England. When Henry needed Henry, his divorce, Henry the Seventh, Henry the Eighth, if, if. he needed his divorce uh, from the daughter of the King of Spain, because Spain was like America today, the enforcer, the global enforcer. There was no way the Pope was going to. Uh, approved that divorce. So what did Henry do? He did the what I call the original Brexit, the first Brexit. He's, he declared, I'm leaving, and I'm leaving with my people. I'm leaving the Catholic fold. I'm setting up my own church. He made himself the head of the church and granted himself his divorce. Okay. And, and that I, now I remarried. And remarried. And that now freed England to enter the trade. And it was actually his daughter. Yeah, because, in, because English... Um, businessmen, let's yes. call them that, mm. now, uh, uh, um, suddenly found out that they did not need the approval or the license of the Pope correct. to get into the business of slave trade, mm -hmm. right? Correct. Is that correct? Absolutely. Because so it sort of like freed, opened the market. It opened the markets. That move of taking themselves out meant, just like the recent Brexit, uh, whilst they were within Europe, uh, they were bound by the rules of European trade, etc., by the Brexit that we all uh, followed, the debates around, etc., they now free themselves to make whatever trade deals they want. Similarly, in that original religious Brexit, where they pulled themselves out of the Catholic fold, set up their own church, they were now free to go in and do what they like. And the profits were so huge that they couldn't simply stand aside. And so that's when the ship that was owned by uh, the royal family. It was Queen Elizabeth the first. Queen Elizabeth the first. She had inherited the ship from her father, uh, King Henry the eighth, and she now chartered that ship to the to, slave to trade. To John Hawkins. To John Hawkins and his family. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, um, I mean, viewers who probably have not read this. Um, the Jesus of Lübeck ship, which yes. she named this book after, mm -hmm. was owned by Queen Elizabeth the first. Correct. Right. Queen Elizabeth I gave it to John Hawkins, the slave trader, mm -hmm. uh, for business. Yes. And then the, the profits from it was shared. Yes. So the queen made a lot of it money. It was her that. contribution to the business, like any business. Investment. Yes, yeah, an investment. That's my contribution to the, the capital 
with which we're going to trade. So this, the, uh, we don't have enough time to discuss this because <laughs> it's uh, my head is just spinning. You know, I mean, when I was reading your book, I've read it once. Now I'm going to read it two more times. Mm -hmm. I, I promise myself that because there's no way you can grasp all this from one reading. Um, it was, I mean, at the risk of repeating what we said, it was a structured, organized business. Absolutely. Sanctioned by the government of um, England. Absolutely. Correct. Which, and the government of England, which was also at that point in time, um, more or less synergized with the Church of England. Yes. Basically. Indeed. Uh? Indeed. So, mm. Indeed. I, and this is very important for our people to understand because, you know, we often get caught up in a conversation. Uh, people say, we were selling our own people. Yeah, now, that's another it, thing. It, it, it is so important to understand that this was a structured enterprise. It wasn't, I, I want people to understand, it wasn't as if uh, we here had for sale signs over our people. Uh, they came Initially, the first boatload that Hawkins got, he kidnapped them off the About coast. About 300 uh, A whole slaves. boatload, 300 slaves, slaves yeah. 300 people. people. We were now enslaved, and he now sailed off with them and sold them in uh, Haiti. Yeah. And it was the profits from that. They were so huge. They now convinced them that this was the way to go. So more and more ships were now diverted into that trade. And now it became more sophisticated because the coastal peoples now became wary. Whenever the ships were coming in, they run further inland. But some of the ones that they had taken away, as always, there will be some who will be good workers. Mm -hmm. Some of those will be co-opted. Mm -hmm. They now have the language. They can go in and speak to the peoples. And they were sent in to reassure the coastal peoples that we're not after you. We're not going to touch you. Work with us. Hear the guns. Gin, rum, rum, gin, guns. So you argue that I mean this thing about so um, our people, if if our people had not been involved in selling their own brothers, nothing would have happened. So you argue that that's not that's not accurate. Yes. You argue that they were manipulated, right? Mm -hmm. They were coerced to get into the business. Absolutely. That's your argument. Absolutely. I mean, it's a nonsense. A narrative that was spun that we ran with because we had not done our own research. Well, what became interesting that was that when abolition came, and the book explains the real reasons for abolition, that it wasn't a change of hearts, it was a change of thinking. And it was a change of thinking forced upon the slavers by the Africans who had revolted, in particular in Haiti. It was the Haitian Revolution that now made it clear that they can't sustain the trade any longer. And that's when they started thinking of abolition. And in the course of the abolition debates, because they didn't, some, the, the, those who were profiting from the system, because any political system has winners and losers, those who were profiting from the system weren't going to roll over and say, you take my daily bread away. They were resisting, they were holding on. And so the arguments in Parliament were actually very revealing. One side arguing that it's evil, it's got to go, etc. The other one says, no, 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 we need it, it must continue, etc. And in the course of those exchanges, evidence spills out as to how the trade was really being instigated. And I remember one of the, uh, um, one of the prime ministers who said that it is we who are instigating the trade. It is we who have the demand. It is we who supply the weapons for them to go and fight other groups and capture them and in order to supply our needs. Mm. Uh, there are so many angles to your... Look, I really enjoyed reading your book. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad. I mean, because I love history, you know. Uh, there are so many angles. Mm. Catholicism, Protestantism, there's that angle of a lot of people, a lot of us don't realize that um, these two religious concepts, um, faiths, um, 
I don't know, film, you can't say films. I know. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that they are, sorry, just on a light note. <laughs> just Now, that, that they were interwoven with the politics oh, yes. of those days. Yes. There was no difference between states and religion at a point in time. That happened later on, yes. particularly in England, mm -hmm. but they were interwoven. And so I enjoyed reading, learning about that in your book. I enjoyed the history of England, which I think every Nigerian should know. Because if we don't understand the history of England, we may not fully understand the story very well. I, I enjoyed that part of your book. I enjoyed the connection, just seeing that, oh, all the blacks in Haiti and Jamaica and all that. The other day I was in a vehicle and I saw a black, uh, there was a black taxi driver driving. And I said, you know, you and I might be family. You don't know. And this was in the US. Yes. Said, you and I might be family. Mm. And he said, how? And I told him a bit of the history mm. of slave trade. And he said, oh, wow. <laughs> you know? it, it was one of the points that I was keen to get across that um, there's a disconnect between the Africans that were taken away and the, those of us who remained. And one of the th things I wanted to do was rather than call them Jamaicans and call them Haitians, you see that I adopted the style of calling them the Africans in Haiti, the Africans in Jamaica, the Africans in America, the Africans in Barbados, mm. because that is the reality. That's a reality. That is the reality. And I wanted to sort of nip in the bud that attitude that was developing amongst those of us who were fortunate to remain, whereby we looked down upon those people. Mm. We despised them as if to say that these were lesser peoples, whereas it would any of us, and indeed many of our lines will be, you find if you trace it, you'll find uh, Keith and Kane amongst those who were taken away. Mm. So I, I needed to create the bridge, okay. uh, but in the process also teach our people uh, the vital history. Uh, which includes the history of Britain, I should say. You, you, you connect the transatlantic slave trade story to colonialism. Yes. Can you explain yes. the connection? People often say, well, you, you, you talk a lot about uh, transatlantic slave trade, but you don't say so much about the Trans-Saharan one, which was older, it preceded the transatlantic, and it was in, it arguably in volume bigger. My explanation to them is that the reason why the transatlantic one is dominant in the narrative, partly because it was much more inhuman. The level of inhumanity was so much greater. But the second aspect, vital aspect, is that it preceded and led to colonization because these unfortunates were not being taken to Britain. They were being taken to islands in the Caribbean America, that yeah. had been taken off the indigenous peoples in those lands. And then even when abolition came, uh, what was the next move? Because at the end of the American War of Independence, both sides, the British and the American settlers, had enlisted the enslaved Africans to fight for them, each giving them the promise, fight for us, when we win, we will free you. Free. So at the end of the war, there was a huge pool of Africans who were now trained in the forbidden way. Forbidden in the sense that the essence of the slave trade was that you don't teach the Africans how to use weapons. Now for their own short-term interests, they had trained this large body of Africans in the use of weapons who had now had experience in killing whites, white slavers, etc. So they weren't going to keep them around. What did they then decide to do? They decided to export them. Where to? back to Africa. So this is how Sierra Leone was created as a first colony for the British. 1808. 1808, and the uh, Liberia was created uh, by the Americans. But the Americans stopped there. They already had the expanse of America to digest, and they were busy digesting that. The British, having lost America now, saw Sierra Leone as the launch pad, stepping stone for the colonization of the whole of West Africa.
and the French now joined them in the race. So you see how there was an immediate uh, transition from slavery, abolition, colonization to Nigeria. The story of Nigeria. Yeah. That's the story of Nigeria. That is, that is our story. And there uh, is no point just to the extent that we say we have some knowledge of Nigeria's story. We start in 1900. No, you can't you start there. You start in 1900. Oh, right. Most people start in 1960. Oh, look at, look at that. <laughs> and then a few others start from 1940. Amazing. The amalgamation of Nigeria. Amazing. Very few people start beyond, I mean, before 1914. You, you've, it, it's, you've got to start from the beginning of the interaction because a lot of the influences uh, uh, from that beginning carried through. The influences of the volume of alcohol that was poured into this country, the volume of weapons that was poured into the country. This was the genesis of casual killings. This was the genesis of irresponsible governance because a lot of the coastal chiefs who, if they were sober, would not engage in the trade. They were plied with full strength alcohol. When I was in, uh, I make you laugh, when I was in, uh, on a tour of the Caribbean, not a Caribbean cruise, we went to some of these rum factories and you were able to sample, because I had read that the, the strength of the rum that was being supplied to these uh, coastal peoples was 80% well, proof. 80%. 80%. So no. while I was in the Caribbean, I, I had the opportunity to sample uh, a rum of 80%. My goodness. Just a little sip of the thing, your ears immediately on fire, your, uh, there was sensation in your ankles. Wow. So you can imagine that it was like opium as it damaged the people of Hong Kong and South China that was forced upon them. The alcohol absolutely debilitated our people such that the, the society then becomes dysfunctional. Imagine the people who were fearful of their own gods, they lived in Maria, etc. And all of a sudden, this full strength, high strength poison is being poured in. Mm. That's when things begin to fall apart. Mm. Wow. <sighs> so, in understanding our story, it's very important we understand this part of the story. So vital. This part of the story. It's the missing link. I understand over 4 million people were taken from this area that we now call Nigeria. Yeah. Uh, Nigeria came into being in 1914, mm. the, the name Nigeria. Mm. Um, but before then, this slave trade story was, I understand over 4 million people were taken from this area, mm -hmm. which is the highest number of, of individuals taken away. Um, from any other area, mm. any part of the world. Mm. So this history should be asked, our history. I mean, nobody should be telling this history more than us. It's, it is for us to tell it. It's our story. We didn't, we didn't initiate it. Yeah. It was brought to us and imposed upon us, but it became us uh, because it so changed our social norms, as our, our conduct and relations with each other, even to this day. If you look at the relationship, for example, between the Shekiri people and the Urubu people, because the Shekiri were more coastal people, they got the first kiss from the slavers. So in the first round, they would have been kidnapped. And then the ch slavers changed their formula to now enlist some of the Shekiri, for example, supply them with the weapons in order to go after the Urubus. Mm -hmm. And then that tension subsists onto this day. Similarly in Yoruba land, similarly in the East, and uh, similarly in the North, because the Fulani were active in the slave trade in terms of intermediaries, uh, the supply of houses, etc. So we were all messed up by this experience, and we need to understand the story that Nigerians, if you don't have context, you begin to think there's something wrong with us as a people mm. because there's no rational explanation for oh. what is going on. But once you get to the tail of the story, yeah. you can then follow the logical thread through 
and then you can begin to make the necessary social and political adjustments in order to stabilize the situation and enable us to move forward. Mm. Well, I, I suspect you will get some pushbacks from, I mean, from pushback for, for this book. I always look forward yeah, to pushback. Yeah, you will get some. <laughs> uh, yeah, especially when we do not, um, I, I mean, I, I think we need to improve on, you know, the way we take in information and analyze information, um, set sentiments aside and just, just look at the figures, the numbers, the data, you know, the facts, and then, you know, make your own, form your own conclusions from them. I think that's the attitude we need. But if we don't do that, mm. then we'll have a lot of problems with people like you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we need to learn from the British because uh, it, it, I'm a member of a group in London, a committee. I was invited by virtue of the work that I did on this book, uh, to a membership of a committee called the 1833 Commemoration Committee, because 1833 was the year of British abolition, abolition. Okay. of slavery. Mm -hmm. And it was the British who alerted me to the fact that the bicentenary of abolition mm -hmm. is just around the corner. 20, 30, in 2033. 200 years. Yes, 200 years. And they are going to mark the occasion. They're going to have... And they're already paper. preparing. They're already preparing. Now. Wow. Uh, there'll that... be conferences, seminars. What are we doing? What are we, what are we planning to do? This is, unfortunately, part of our history. We can't get away from it. Mm -hmm. It happened, and we need to understand what happened, how it happened, the consequences the legacies and the lessons to be learned from it hmm. to avoid us repeating this again. Delugun, thank you for joining us on Channels Book Club. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thanks for joining us. Well done. Thanks. Thanks.